Uh, good morning, everybody. Good to see everybody again. Uh, my name is Will Walter, and this is the second sermon in my three sermon series where we're doing a deep dive into the Old Testament, and we're talking about God's promise plan, uh, which is really um, Him blessing, promising to bless us, blessings of the heart, uh, if we're obedient to Him. And we're looking at how everything in the Old Testament points to Christ. The entirety of the scriptures point to Christ. All paths lead to Christ. Um, all the PowerPoints will be on the website um, as the sermons are preached. And the notes will also be on the website. There's a lot of information. And uh, and I, I just hope that, hope that you go back and look at the material and really study the material and and are just super, super encouraged by it. To reiterate uh, what we talked about last week, the, the purpose of this sermon series is to increase our faith. Uh, young Christians, giving them an opportunity to see the depth and the perfection uh, of the Bible and how God crafted it together so perfectly as to be everything we need to be in a perfect relationship with Him. For us seasoned Christians, uh, the, hopefully this will reinvigorate our faith. It will we'll be you know, looking at scriptures that you've that you've read many many times before. Hopefully, there's new information that's presented, and we can just appreciate and be reinvigorated uh, to want to um, just take up that banner and uh, and, and uh, follow Christ and imitate Christ to the best of our ability. Uh, the Bible is called Perfection, 1 Corinthians 13. I believe one of the overarching things in this sermon series uh, it is, is meant to show that the Bible is absolutely perfect. It's amazing. It's intricately woven together. God's put it not just the books written by the specific authors, but where the books are placed in the Bible. Uh, it's all perfect. And uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, I'll read this in verse 15. Uh, this is what I read last week. I'm going to read it again. It says, Paul talking to Timothy, How from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation. They are able. It doesn't guarantee they will. It's dependent upon the effort we put into it. And so I'm calling all of us to step up our effort and to make an effort, uh, a greater effort, to search through the scriptures, and, and I'm hoping that this sermon series is a springboard for us to be excited to, to sink our teeth into the scriptures and learn new things and share new things with, with each other and with those that we're reaching out to. And then in Luke 24, in verse 27, and this is this is after Jesus uh, died and was resurrected, and before the many people knew he had been resurrected yet. He finds these two guys on the road to Emmaus who are disciples, and he talks to them for hours. Um, and he sum the, the book of Luke here summarizes what he was talking about in verse 27. It says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And to reiterate what I said last week, and I'll say the same thing as intro next week, that when it says scripture, when Luke's talking about Scripture, it means the Old Testament. It means the Jewish Bible, the Old Testament. And how it says how everything in Scripture, all the Scripture, points to him. And one of the things I've discovered as I've put this whole series together, I've been studying this, is that every single book has multiple references, multiple, uh, multiple, multiple, multiple points to Christ and uh, in various ways. And it's just amazing. But the entirety of the Old Testament points to Christ. Last week, we talked about, we talked about covenants, which are uh, God's binding legal agreement with his people. Uh, there was eight major covenants we looked at. We looked at the Edenic covenant, the um, Abrahamic covenant, the Noah covenant, the Davidic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the New covenant. I left out a couple there. There's eight major covenants. Uh, there's many, many promises. There's binding promises that God makes to us in those covenants. Uh, 
Ultimately, they all lead to the promise of a Savior who would make it possible for us to have an intimate, personal relationship with God. And God's promise plan is for us to live in concert with His will. This week, we're going to be looking at gospel portraits. We're going to look at progressive revelation that I'm going to demonstrate uh, through something called the Doctrine of the Lamb, what this, this whole concept of progressive revelation is. And then we're going to be looking at the three offices in the Jewish nation, the Old Testament, that God set aside that will require three separate and distinct offices of leadership that God set aside to lead his people and how Jesus perfectly exemplifies each of those three offices. And then we're going to be looking at, looking at how we, as individual disciples, can also follow in Jesus' footsteps for those three offices. And then next week will be the last, the last lesson, and we're going to look at Christophanes, uh, typologies and prophecies, which we'll we'll discuss next week, and which are uh, really cool and uh, and really really exciting. So, let's jump right into this. The first thing we're going to talk about today are gospel portraits. Now, all Scripture points to Christ. Um, the gospel portraits are God's specific use of Old Testament concepts themes or events to portray Christ. And, and that's what we need sometimes, many of the time, rather than just simply being told something, if we have a picture of it, a portrait of it, or an example of it, it really helps us, it helps us to understand um, better what is coming and the true nature of that thing. As an example, parables are, are an example of that. Jesus, of course, told many, many parables. And uh, one that most people are familiar with, familiar with is the parable of the sower. And he uses the parable of, um, you know, the, the sower has seeds. He wants to plant seeds to, to grow. And he's scattering the seeds. And he scatters them in four different locations. And the, the parable talks about the seed that is, uh, you know, it's on the path. It gets trampled on. There's the you know the, the parable. The part of part of the uh, analogy is um, you know one that the, the birds take away, it, and then there's one that takes deep root. And basically, parables are meant to help us understand uh, a spiritual truth. It's the same way with gospel portraits. In the Old Testament, God used portraits or pictures to help us understand Christ. And the amazing thing I think that we're going to see here is that. We may have read some of these scriptures many, many times, but never realized that part of the purpose was to portray, to provide this portrait of Christ. So the first one that we're going to talk about is the ark. And that's in Genesis chapters 6 through 8. And we talked about that last week. And uh, God had become so distraught with man's sinfulness against each other, against themselves, against him, that he, he had no choice but to destroy all life on the earth. And so he found one righteous man, Noah. So he said, Noah, you and your wife and your three sons and their wives, you can build an ark and then you can have all the animals, you know, the non-water you know water animals on board with you. And um, I'm going to cleanse the earth of its sin. And then so Noah built the ark over hundreds of years. And the, the, the waters came, and, and the eight people and the animals went on the ark, and for 40 days it rained. And then for some time after that, um, you know, the, it, it was receding, but it took a while. And finally the ark landed on a mountaintop, and then uh, Noah got out, and then God, uh, with all his, you know, his wife and his, his family, all the animals, and then the earth was repopulated. And uh, Genesis 6, verse 6, it says, The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. And so the portrait, the portraits that we're seeing here uh, of Christ and of God, one, uh, just the, the concept of personal righteousness and how man's wickedness and his sin just hurts God so much. And that's something for us to consider, is our level of personal righteousness directly impacts God. It says... It says that the Lord was grieved. You know, the Lord was grieved. That's like the heaviest kind of sorrow. 
And when we are sinning, when we are not being righteous, when we're intentionally sinning, uh, it really fills God's heart with pain. And that's something that, that comes through in the portrait of the, of the ark. Um, another thing that comes through in the portrait of the ark is, is God's judgment. And, you know, judgment, spiritual judgment, is something that in our day and age, uh, it's almost taboo. Uh, we don't talk about it. Nobody talks about it. This concept of God's judgment, but it's very real and it's portrayed here. And in, in our culture, we're, we're in a time right now that's it's referred to as post-modernism. And what that means is that we're, we've been trending in this direction for a long time, but that there is no absolute truth. Postmodernism says, your truth is fine for you, my truth is fine for me, and uh, your truth, as long as it's good for you, is good for you, but there's no absolute truth. And that's a real problem. When we're talking about the Bible, we're talking about being disciples, the Bible is the truth. Jesus says that in John 14, I am the truth, the way, and the life. There is an absolute truth. It's Jesus, it's the Bible, and it's a very dangerous uh, around us. This is what's be. This is the culture beating on us, and we have to understand that God. There's judgment, and God's judgment is very real, and it's based upon our behavior, and um, and it's something that that we just need to be aware of. That's a portrait that's made now. Um, just because there's judgment, it doesn't mean that as disciples we're not filled with grace and mercy and compassion. And that's what God commands us to do in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So just because there's God's ultimate judgment, it doesn't mean that we don't love people and forgive people. Uh, we need forgiveness uh, and we, we try to teach people, right? We're not harshly judgmental, uh, but God's judgment is very real. And that's a portrait that we see in uh, as we look at the ark. Another uh, concept we see in this portrait is this concept of representational righteousness. God wanted to destroy the earth. Man had become so sinful. He found one man who was righteous that through that one man, the earth could be repopulated again. And of course, that's a foreshadowing. That's a portrait of Christ's representational righteousness. Through his perfect life and his perfect sacrifice, for us, he, his blood covers our sin and his righteousness makes us righteous. And so the ark is a portrait of representational righteousness. And the ark is a, a portrait also of um, the concept of a need for a savior from judgment. The ark was the savior. Without the ark, the eight people, all the animals could not have been saved from, the, from, the, uh, from judgment, from, from the floodwaters. And so this, this concept this portrait is introduced, this portrait of Christ um, as a savior is introduced uh, with the ark. Amazing, amazing, right? Okay, the next one is one that I dare say uh, probably no one has ever thought of before. Uh, and it's, it's in Song of Songs. And in Song of Songs, um, it's really, it's beautiful poetry around a love that a man and his wife have for each other um, and it demonstrates this is not the portrait but Song of Songs demonstrates that contentment and fulfillment are found in exclusivity and the marriage relationship uh, this was introduced back in Genesis uh, I know I mentioned uh, basically the man and his wife became one um, but this is this that's really one of the themes of the Song of Songs <coughs> about the gospel the specific gospel portrait of Song of Songs uh, is the portrait of a king who had a passionate love for a servant girl. In Song of Songs, of course, Solomon is the king, and it's a letter written back and forth between him and, I'll say, one of his wives, right? <laughs> he had many wives, but but we learn about this woman, this, this girl, uh, in Song of Songs 1, verses 6 and 7, she says, as she's writing to Solomon, do not stare at me because I am dark, because I am darkened by the sun. My mother's sons were very angry with me and made me take care of the vineyards. 
my own vineyard I have neglected. What she's saying there is, she, she, that's a working class family right there. That they're working the farms, they're working the vineyards. She's saying I'm dark, like I'm, I'm, sun, I'm sunburnt, right? Uh, because I, my, uh, my, my, my brothers were angry with me and they made me take care of the vineyards. It's a working family. It's not a princess who's living the lap of, uh, life in the lap of luxury. She's working the vineyards. She's sunburnt. And she says, my own vineyard I have neglected, meaning she's not taking care of herself. And, you know, a, prin a princess born to a high-born family, of course, would have lotions and treatments and all that stuff. The best foods, you know, she didn't have that. And, and really, it's a, it's a servant girl. It's a poor girl. And you have a love affair, a passionate love affair between a king, Solomon, and a servant girl. And the gospel portrait, of course, is that we are the poor servant girls. We're sinful. We're nobodies. We're a speck in the earth. We're, you know, we're one grain of sand in the earth. We're nothing. And yet the king, Christ, is desiring to have a passionate affair with us and be and, and so much so that he would go to the cross for us it's a beautiful beautiful gospel portrait of uh, of christ and his love for us let's look over in abraham i'm sorry in genesis chapter 22 there's no book of abraham the next thing that we're going to talk about is um, abraham's sacrifice when god called him to sacrifice his son and i just have to read this because it's Honestly, it's, it's shocking. <clears throat> Genesis 22 and verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servant, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he carried himself, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, said to his father Abraham, Father! Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? God answered, uh, Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. together. It's amazing. In the words they use for each other, you could tell. You can just tell the love they have for one another. In verse 9, when they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied, do not lay a hand on the boy. He said, do not do anything. And he goes on. And then there's a ram that's caught in the thicket that God provides. God provides the, uh, the sacrifice. There's so many things in here that I'm, I'm not going to talk about that really are a portrait uh, in, a, in, a, in a type of Christ. And, I, and we're going to be talking about this next week. Some of these specifics that specifically point to Christ, but the, the gospel portrait that I, that I want to talk about is a father being asked to slay his son. It's absolutely shocking about 10 or 15 years ago, I remember it wasn't the first time I read this, but maybe 20 years, I don't know, I, I read it and I, and, I, and I just struggled so much thinking how can God ask any man to do this to his son that's barbaric, it's inhuman, it's not right, what kind of a God would do that? Even though he said he, he didn't make him go through with it, the cruelty to ask him to do, it's just, when you really think about it, it's shocking. And then it didn't take me long to realize that's what God did with Jesus. That's what God did with his own son because of my sin and your sin. And I think we need to be shocked by that scripture, that it's a shocking gospel portrait. We need to be shocked by that because it needs to shock us into trying to live <laughs> 
lives that imitate Christ and not take for granted the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. <coughs> um, other gospel portraits are the destruction of Jericho. You know, they, the Israelites cross through the Jordan River, and, and, and which is, you know, going through the waters and then destroying Jericho, which is full of sin. The portrait, obviously, is going through the waters of baptism, so the sin in our life is destroyed forever. Uh, there's the portrait of the tabernacle, which was the big, amazing, glorious traveling tent the Israelites had in the desert. It's really fascinating when you read this book, two or three chapters in, um, in the Old Testament, um, talking about the tabernacle and all the parts and pieces and the dimensions and the specs and all this. Uh, but essentially the tabernacle was in the wilderness and it's a portrait of, uh, you know, that, that's where God resided in that tabernacle. And the gospel portrait is the portrait and the portrayal of Christ living inside us. And we're surrounded by this wilderness uh, of sin. Uh, another one is the bronze snake. I'm not going to go too far into it, but, you know, there was poisonous snakes. And if they bit, bit one of the Israelites when they were in the desert, then they'd die. And Moses had on a staff uh, a caricature of a, um, a snake that was bronze. And if you got bit, if you looked up at the snake on the staff, then you would live. The gospel portrait, of course, is Christ on the cross and looking up to him, which is, you know, the terminology is following him and accepting that sacrifice, uh, then we will be saved. We won't die, uh, spiritually die. <clears throat> many other portraits, but those are, uh, those are just some that I want to talk about, but they're, they're really fascinating. Okay, let's talk about progressive revelation. Um, Progressive revelation are teachings that first appear in Scripture um, and are repeated in subsequent pages. You know, it's starting out further back in the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, so on and so forth. And the themes are repeated as you work your way through the Old, you know, the, the Old Testament towards at the end of you know, Malachi, is the last book of the Old Testament. Um, so they're repeated in the subsequent pages and their meaning and their significance is, is developed more and more with each reference until they reach fruition in the New Testament. And it just goes back to, as we go through some of this, it just goes back to the fact that the Bible was assembled perfectly. There can be no doubt. Genesis was meant to be the first book. Malachi was meant to be the last book of the Old Testament. Matthew was meant to be the, the first book of the New Testament with the four Gospels. Revelation was meant to be the last book in the New Testament, in the Bible. <clears throat> there can be no question as we're looking through some of these things. Absolutely amazing. But to show an example of progressive revelation, we're going to talk about the doctrine of the Lamb. Let's look back in Genesis 4, verses 3 and 7. 3 through 7. The doctrine of the Lamb. We know Christ was the Lamb, and, and we're all familiar. Even if we haven't studied this out, we know that the Old Testament, uh, the, 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 old, the temple and tabernacle system of sacrifices required the slaying of the firstborn, the slaying of perfection, right? The Lamb and the blood needed to be, needed to be sacrificed for the forgiveness of sins. We know that. We're going to take a deep dive into this concept of the Lamb. All right, so Genesis chapter uh, 4 Verses 3 to 7, this is Cain and Abel, and they're both asked to give a uh, sacrifice to God. Now, Cain, worked, he was a farmer. He worked the soil. He, he gave some of the first fruits of his vegetables, uh, where Abel was, um, Abel was a shepherd, and he gave the firstborn of the flock. He gave the lamb. <clears throat> verse, chapter 4, and verse 3. Um, in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, but Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door, it desires to have you, but you must master it. We're introduced right here very broadly to the, the, necess the concept of the necessity of the lamb. Uh, that a lamb, animal sacrifice, is necessary. It's a very broad um, introduction to the lamb. 
right? Let's go to let's go to Genesis 22. We we just read Genesis 22, all right? Um, and we see in Genesis 22 that Abraham was ready to slay his son Isaac. God said no. Maybe the angel even grabbed his wrist. We don't know. Uh, but after we did that, and I should have read this in, in verse 13, but essentially, um, verse verse 13, Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram, sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. Now we're, concept, we're introduced to this concept that God will provide the lamb, All right, which is a little bit more... First, is necessity for the lamb to be slain. Now we're introduced. God will provide the lamb. Okay, let's turn over now to Exodus chapter 12. And this is after Moses has gone back into Egypt. And he's um, negotiated, you could say, with Moses. And he's going to lead all the Israelites out of Egypt to the Red Sea to the Promised Land. All right? And he's talking about the Passover in chapter 12. And he's giving them all the things to, that they have to do to prepare themselves. And one of those things is they have to slaughter a lamb and put the, put the blood on the door frames and, and all that. I'm not going to read all of it, but I'm going to read verses 6 and 7. Take care, of, take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them which meaning a year old male lamb without defect, must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and top of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. So um, this is telling us that the lamb is going to be slayed. And that, that not only is it going to be slayed, but it's going to be slayed because the blood of the lamb is necessary to save the Israelites. So the first one, Genesis 4, necessity of the lamb. Genesis 22, God will provide the lamb. Here we are, moving throughout the Bible. Exodus 12, the lamb will be slayed and the blood will be necessary. Um, let's look over in Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 22, verse 21. Oh, in numbers, whoops. Leviticus 22, okay. And here's Moses and Aaron telling, you know, telling the people um, what to do in terms of sacrifice. In verse 21, when anyone brings from the herd or flock a fellowship offering to the Lord to fulfill a special vow or as a free will offering, it must be without defect or blemish to be acceptable. And now we're introduced to the concept that the lamb must have no blemish. The animal sacrifice was only acceptable if it had no blemish. And we know, of course, that's pointing to Christ being without sin. In Isaiah chapter 53, we're introduced to the concept that the lamb, in addition to there's necessity for the lamb, God will provide the lamb, the lamb will be slayed for the blood, the lamb must be without blemish, Isaiah 53, we're introduced to the concept that the lamb would be a person. And I'm going to quote it. I've written it on the computer here. It says, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. The lamb's going to be a person. And then we turn over to John in chapter 1 and verse 29. And John the Baptist says, Look, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So in John 1, we're introduced to the fact that, yes, it was a person, and the person was Jesus. So, isn't that amazing? You see this concept of the lamb started out in the beginning of Genesis in very broad terms and it becomes more and more and more narrow and there can be no doubt exactly about Jesus being the lamb, his blood, without blemish for our, for our sins. Um, there's just no doubt. And 
this progressive revelation is one of the ways that, that God uses to give us faith, to help us to see that he put the Bible together, that it's perfect, that the, that the purpose is very, very clear. There can be no mistaking, all right? Uh, but obviously, we have to dig a little bit to find that. Um, a couple other, um, um, couple other things with progressive revelation examples that I'm not. I'm just briefly touching touch on. One is the concept of the seed, uh, the seed ultimately being Jesus. Um, but this concept of the seed were introduced to in Genesis three that the seed would be, or the savior would be the seed of a woman. And then it would be, that's in Genesis 3. In, in Genesis 12, it would be the seed of Abraham. Further on in Genesis, is the seed of Isaac. Further on in Genesis, is the seed of Jacob. In Genesis 49, it's the seed of Judah. In 2 Samuel 7, it's the seed of David. And we talked about that last week. That's one of the themes in the Bible, that the Savior is the seed of David. And then in Isaiah 7, we see that the seed will be born of a virgin. Right? Like, okay. How clear can that be, right? How much clearer could that be? But it works out, you know, the seed of a woman and just narrows and narrows and narrows and narrows down. It's amazing. Uh, another uh, progressive thing about progressive revelation were the Old Testament laws. Uh, God provided these Old Testament laws for very specific reasons when they were given, but there were deeper spiritual meanings that were revealed by the presence of Christ, by his life, and then by his Sermon on the Mount. Um, don't have time to talk about that, but again, go back and read these things on your own and, and study these, these things on your own. So that's the concept of progressive revelation. All right, now we're going to talk about the concept of uh, prophet, priest, and king, the three major leadership offices in the nation of Israel. God has given us free will to make our decisions. He set, has set up his promise plan such that we become more useful, more righteous, and more Christ-like as part of our lifelong journey spent persevering and overcoming by applying biblical principles and by relying on him. Now, Old Testament human leadership offices in the Old Testament, I'm sorry, I just said that, help uh, guide and assist the Jews in this journey. In the three specific offices Three leadership offices were those of prophet, priest, and king. And, and um, just as, as a quick analogy to help help you understand, um, I like to think of in the United States, um, we have three branches of government. All right, we've got the executive branch, which is the president, and his his role is to um, enforce the laws. We've got the legislative branch, which of course is the House of Representatives and the Senate, and their job is to make the laws. And they're you know elected by the people, and then you have the judicial branch, which their job is to interpret the laws. Three separate offices with very distinct and defined purposes, and all come together to basic in, in with the founding fathers. This is what we're going to set up to lead the people. Well, God, uh, that's how I like to think of these three offices in the Old Testament: prophet, priest, and king. Three very distinct, separate, defined offices in total, meant to lead the people, okay? Um, so what we're gonna look at is those three offices in the Old Testament, and then we're gonna look at how it was actually prophesied that, that Christ would exemplify those offices perfectly, and then we're gonna look in the New Testament, see how those came true, and then we're gonna talk about our role as Christians, as disciples, as Christ followers, of also taking on those three offices. <clears throat> okay, so uh, the prophet. The purpose of the prophet was to bring God to the people. All right? And we think of prophets, we think of people who are speaking God's word. right? And what they're doing is they're bringing God to the people through God's word. That was the purpose of a prophet. All right, in Exodus 3 and verse 10, in the uh, God saying to the people, so now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh. I'm sorry, he's talking to Moses. Uh, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Um, Moses was uh, well, one of the most famous prophets, obviously. 
And the purpose was to bring God to the people. And that's what he did. He went to the people and he brought God's message to the people. We've got to, you know, we're, we're out of here, right? Um, we're, we're leaving Egypt. We're leaving slavery. We're going to the promised land. All right, the next one was the priest. And the first priest was Moses' brother Aaron. And, and he, <clears throat> he was ordained uh, in the desert, as they're wandering in the desert. But he became, he and his, uh, his sons became the first priests. Exodus 29 and verse 9 says, In this way you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. And the purpose of the priest was to, to bring the people to God. I mean, the prophet brought God to the people. The priests brought the people to God through the, 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 um, the ceremonies and helping them be ceremonially, ceremonially clean, the sacrifice of animals. <laughs> because of these sacrifices and these ceremonies, the people could then access God. And that was the purpose of the priest. All priests were in the line of Levi. The king, best exemplified by David, the purpose of the king was to lead God's people. 2 Samuel 5, second part of uh, verse 2, you will shepherd my people Israel and you will become their ruler. The first king was Saul, the second king was David. Uh, good kings included Josiah, Hezekiah, Jehoshaphat, and they were considered uh, good kings because they destroyed idols, they followed the book of law, and they essentially led the people uh, in accordance with God's laws. Bad kings included Ahab, Manasseh, Rehoboam, Jeroboam. Unfortunately, many more, and there were many more bad kings than there were good kings. And that's, if you go back and look at Deuteronomy 17, God said, I don't want you to have a king, I'm your king, but because you're demanding it, because you want to be all, like all these nations, I'll give you a king. And uh, of course, God, as God knew, the majority of these kings were, were bad kings because they didn't have his best interests in mind, they were sinful. Uh, they relied on foreign kings instead of God. They worshiped idols. They abused their power. All right. So let's talk about Jesus <clears throat> and how he exemplified all three of these offices. Um, in Deuteronomy 18, in verse 18, God says, I will raise up for them a prophet like you. He's, Mo, he's talking to Moses. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I commanded him. That's the prophecy that Jesus was going to be the ultimate occupant of the office of prophet. In Matthew 21, verse 11, um, the crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus was recognized as a prophet. It was recognized that Jesus was bringing God to the people. And in, uh, in John 1, and verse 1, it makes it clear that Jesus was the word. Jesus is the word of God. The entire Bible is Jesus in the written form. So, you know, not only obviously when he quoted scripture and he explained things to people, was he bringing God to the people, but in his very nature, in his very being, in his actions, um, in the way he treated people, in the way he forgave people, in the way that he took the Pharisee to task, in his very nature, he brought God to the people by his life and his teachings. And so, so Jesus occupies this office, this office of prophet, bringing God to the people. We're called to imitate Jesus. So how can we be, be prophets? Uh, and we can't in the sense that we think that we can speak the word of God and it comes through us and it's ordained through us. But that's not true. We, we are prophets as disciples. We're prophets because simply by sharing God's word, by studying the Bible with people, Right by preaching God's word, we're bringing God to the people, and that's how we can fulfill that office of prophet. And we have to ask ourselves, how is that going? How are we doing bringing God to the people? And I know for me, it's not going great. It's uh, with, with COVID, the lockdown, and, and it's a challenge. It's a real challenge. And I know I need to do much better. And I'm challenging all of us to think about how can we be prophets? How can we bring God's word to the people? Okay, then the next concept we talk about is the office of priest. And in Psalm 110 and verse 4, um, he says, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And, and he's prophesying about Jesus, right? And then it's fulfilled in Hebrews 4, 
verses 14, 5 to 10, and I'm just going to read one, one snippet. But it's basically talking about Jesus as our high priest and how we don't need any more sacrifice for sins. No more earthly priests because they're imperfect. We have a perfect priest in Jesus. Uh, but he says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. <clears throat> so the, remember, the, the, the purpose of the priest was to bring uh, the people to God. And that's what Jesus allowed us to access God directly through his sacrifice. And that's how he acts as a priest under the new covenant. And then we have to ask again, we're called to imitate Christ. What does it mean for us to be priests? It sounds kind of weird. sounds kind of religious. All right. Um, but if it simply means bringing the people to God, it could simply mean bringing people to Bible talk, bringing people to church, introducing people to the true God, to the true Bible. And, uh, you know, just like Jesus exemplified, um, you know, being a prophet and a priest in his very nature, we can do the same thing by living lives that are different. Um, when we have people in our homes, you know, we can bring people to God. We can show people God by the way we treat our spouses, by the way we raise our kids, by our patience and our perseverance and our, and our mercy. Right, by the way we act at work, how it can be so much different than our co-workers, we can bring the people to God and act as priests. <clears throat> okay, and the last one. And well, let me, let me stick on priests for a second. First Peter 2 verse 9 says, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belong to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. I mean, we're specifically called to be priests under the new covenant. All right, the last office was that of king. And um, the so Jesus in Zechariah 6 and verse 13, the prophecy about Jesus being king, it says, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord and he will be clothed with majesty and will sit and rule on his throne. It is fulfilled in Luke 1, verses 30 to 33. He will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. There is again this, this theme that Jesus is the son of David. Uh, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign forever. And, and remember, the purpose of the king was to lead God's people. And Jesus is king because he leads his church. That's why our church is the church of Christ, not the church of any one person, not the church of any one doctrine. It's Christ's church because he's the leader. And he, it might be a hard concept to understand, but he's the leader because this is what leads our church. This is what the only thing that can lead Christ's church um, is, because remember, in John 1, 1, Jesus is the word. This is Christ in the written form. This is Christ right here. So we, Jesus leads us by us following this. And that's one thing I really have loved about our church over, it's crazy to say the, the three decades I've been a part of it, but we will change the way we go about things, the way we interpret doctrine, if you will, as we evolve. Um, and as we realize we're maybe not doing things quite right, we got to change things. <clears throat> and that's a sign that Christ is leading our church. Um, it's not any one person. Um, and then the question is, how can we be you know, kings, if you will, of the new covenant? And really, it's, if the purpose of king is just to lead God's people, in that sense, we're all king because we're all leading somebody. Well, number one, we're leading ourselves in our own lives. But if we have kids, we're leading our kids. If we have any kind of um, leadership office in the church, family group leader, if you're discipling another person, then you're leading that person. And you go up the line, you know, family group leaders, zone leaders, et cetera, et cetera. So we're all called, in that sense, to be kings, to, to lead other people, to lead God's people in accordance with, um, with God's laws. And in Romans 12, verse 8, one of the things it says, of course, it says, if it is leadership, let him govern diligently. And specifically saying, some people have the, the gifts of leadership, uh, let them, you know, let them do it effectively. And, and we all have different gifts of different leadership, but my point is that we're all leaders. <clears throat> all right. So let's bring this thing to a conclusion. Now, what we've been talking about is gospel portraits, which are Old Testament concepts, themes, and events that are meant to portray Christ. We talked about the concept of progressive revelation.
and specifically looked at the doctrine of the Lamb. And then we talked about prophet, priest, and king, how God established those three offices of human leadership in the Old Testament, distinct and uh, uh, defined offices so that God's people could be led in accordance with his laws. Jesus uh, exemplified and held all of those perfectly. And then we are called to also take on the, those mantles of leadership in varying degrees. Uh, and that's to, you know, to prepare his people to be close to him. So uh, next week we'll have our, our, our third uh, sermon in this three-part series. And we'll be talking about Christophanies, which are where Christ actually appeared in the Old Testament. You may have never thought about that or even known that. We're talking about several examples of that. We're talking about typologies, which are kind of similar to gospel portraits, but are um, you know people and, and events that are types of Christ. And then we're also going to be talking about prophecies. So I hope everyone has a great day, and, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks.